Welcome to the BWI Live Show. I'm Thomas Frank Carr, Sean Fitz, and not Ryan Snyder. Unless Ryan Snyder and uh, Nate Bauer got into some sort of face-off uh, situation this weekend. Uh, sure. Nate, is that you, or is that Ryan wearing your face? I, I just I just want to acknowledge that that's one of the greatest movies of all time. Isn't it? He's not wrong. Yeah. I mean, what a what a concept. They just <laughs> play each other. I mean, Travolta, Cage. It's masterful. I love I it. I can see this the the jacket on it with the half the face on the each of it on each of them. Ah, oh, it's perfect. The wow. the John the John Woo doves just oh cinematic masterpiece. Love it. Uh Nate is here because today uh, we are making a switch. We are calling an audible here on Monday and uh, Penn State football. They play on Saturdays. So it's pretty important that we talk about the game on Monday morning. So we've made the switch now uh, Monday to have this be the football show. We'll talk about the game. We'll recap every game on Monday. And then Thursday is going to be the recruiting show. Um, we'll still get into some practice observations and we'll still talk about the upcoming game a little bit, but it'll be recruiting focused. And it's an important week to do that because uh, the whiteout is coming up. So we're talking about the whiteout list, what you should expect for the upcoming biggest show in college football and how everyone is uh, getting ready for it coming up on Thursday. But today, Nate's here because he's back from Champaign. Was it as champagne as you expected it to be? How was your experience on the road, Nate? And what did you take away from the game on Saturday? Uh, yeah, it was it was fine. Champagne is a fine town. It's um, you know, I, I think that would it would be fun to go to college there. To be honest with you, like it's it's a it's a fun little town um, that is very far away from Chicago and any other major city. So the drive was less than great, but. The atmosphere was fine, right? They they, uh, they they tried to have an orange out. It was the students showed up. The rest of the crowd did not. Penn State apparently not a huge draw. I, you get it, right? Illinois coming off of a loss that was pretty bad. Um, you know, it, it was it was it was fine. It was fine. And then to be honest with you, it was it was as though both teams reflected that a little bit in terms of how they played for really for Penn state for the first 40 minutes of that game. Um, and for Illinois, I mean, they just uh, can't say they ever quite showed up. Right. Yeah. And just five turnovers. Uh, you know, that, that can't happen. And so it, uh, it kind of was what it was. Yeah. Fitz, we didn't really talk about that. The, the 11 AM local start. Um, that is a narrative thing that we talk about anytime Penn State goes to the Midwest and plays a big noon game. Uh, did, did you see elements of a sleepy start from maybe individual players or something when you went back and watched the game? I, I, I don't think it's so much the 11 a.m. kick. Is it The noon kick is different in terms of preparation. So, like, you got to train your body to be in the right spot. And you're right. It's it's absolutely a narrative. There's I think it's been pretty well disproven in some places that the 11 a.m. local start, whatever, is not great. It'll be interesting to see. In a couple of weeks, I think um, USC may end up kicking it like eight or, or excuse me, like nine or ten. So that might be something there. But I think it's more of a narrative than anything right now. I think Penn State just started slow. Penn State started slow. Um, it, it, noon kicks over the years, whether it's Central Time, Eastern Time. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I started my impressions by referencing that and referencing that that wasn't the reason that they were sloppy. It was execution. Yeah. But, you know, that's going to play into some of it. So I I. I can see the argument for it, but if you're looking for an excuse to lean on, it's it doesn't really have strong legs, I think. Uh, we're going to talk about the game. We're going to break down the offense. Should be concerned about what happened in that execution that Fitz talked about. The defense, what do you take away from a dominant performance with five turnovers against a team that this is all? This is always what happens. We go into the game and saying, Luke Altmeyer, mm, watch out for Luke Altmeyer. He throws four interceptions, and then you go, ah, it's just Luke Altmeyer in the Illinois offense. So we're going to try and... To, put some to perspective fair, no, on no, no, that. no, 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 no. To be fair, you said Luke Altmaier was bad. You were right. And we, we try, I even tried to get you to walk it back a little bit because we <laughs> still remember the Michigan offensive line from last yes. year, which was not the best. And then ended up, ended up being the, literally being the best, winning the award for the best offensive line. Yeah. So we walked those things just a little bit back sometimes, but you were, you were on that. You said he can't read defenses and he can't throw the ball. He showed on Saturday he can't read defenses and he can't throw the ball, which is uh, yeah. was was pretty good for pretty fortunate for Penn State. They didn't they didn't do the most with those, as you can understand. Uh, I think twenty points off of five turnovers, 
does not hit your average of what you want to turn that into, especially with the field position that they had. Um, but yeah, that is, I would say Luke Altmaier, very helpful in Penn State's defensive uh, stat building this weekend. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said to you, like going into studying their offense, and we'll get to this today on T. Frank's film room later on Monday, if you're watching this on replay, uh, getting into what their plan of attack was and what Illinois' offense is, which is, from the passing perspective, not a whole lot. Like, there's not a whole lot going on uh, there. But we'll get into all of that on the show today. What we got to get to right now is some big breaking news, I think maybe an hour ago. This went live. It's the big game special, the whiteout coming up this weekend. So if you are a new subscriber, you're here on uh, the YouTube show, you haven't made the dive because, you know, you can, you can hear us talk, you can hear the conversation about this stuff. All the information, the full-on, full effect of what Blue White Illustrated can do for you and your Penn State fandom, 50% off right now for new subscribers. You can get in uh, and, and you can be a part of the Penn State football community, the hardcore people that are there every day, day in, day out, living Penn State football. If you love that and you're watching a YouTube show at 10 a.m. on a Monday, you're definitely one of those people. This is going to enhance your life. Blue White Illustrated going on sale right now for 50% off the price, but that's for just this week. So before the whiteout game, our big game special, get in touch with that. Get into the Blue White Illustrated uh, Lines End message board so you can get to the information and the stuff that you want to know about Penn State football from our experts. The next thing that you need to do if you are a Penn State football fan is go to this game, and Tixman Jim can help you out with that. The most exciting atmosphere in college football. Talk about that every time we talk about Tixman Jim. This is the game. This is the most exciting atmosphere in college football. The whiteout, primetime game against what I would say, and I'm going to maybe make a hot take here, Penn State's actual rival in the Big Ten over the last 15 years, a program on a similar level that has given Penn State trouble over the years. Iowa, great matchup. You're going to want to watch this game. So talk to Tixman Jim, 302-521-521. 8380. If you've been looking for a reliable source of Penn State football tickets, this is your place. TixmanJim.com, formerly PSUTixman.com. He's been running his ticket exchange in Wilmington, Delaware for over 25 years. Every buyer is handled with courtesy and respect, so you're not just going to the game. You're going to the game guaranteed that you're going to get a you're going to get uh what you're expecting from the ticket at least. Every ticket purchase is guaranteed, most every ticket is transferred to your Ticketmaster email address. Proceeds are used to fund the PSU AA Chapter Scholarship Fund and the PSU Levi Lamb Fund for athletic scholarships. Get tickets to the Whiteout game, the homecoming game and of course Michigan the Stripe Out. Maybe not the Whiteout game but the most important home game of the 2023 season. All of them available Tixman Gym dot com or you can contact him directly if you're watching here on our youtube channel 302-521-8380 tell him the tell him t frank of the bwi live show sent you okay let's talk about the game and we're going to start on offense because the main talking point about this game has been what happened what happened to the penn state offense that scored 101 points going into this game um so let's start with the let's start with Drew Aller because that's where everyone wants to start with the quarterback, the passing attack. Fitz, 48% completion percentage. He completed uh, 90% of his passes heading into this game from his adjusted completion percentage, which takes away drops and, and throwaways. Are you concerned? What did you see that led to that outcome against Illinois? You're on mute. If you excuse me, I'm just a little shell shocked by the Iowa natural rival comment. I see some people in the uh, in the chat have picked up on that. I got to can I can I chime in? I just looked it up. They are 11 and 11 uh, since they joined the Big Ten. So yeah, um, it, what's funny about that is is Franklin started about four zero in those guys. Like it was, I mean, there were some close ones in there. Absolutely, it's, you know, it's it's kind of like that. That of course, Ohio State, Michigan are going to get the the they're going to be linked there. But it's like, is it Iowa? Is it Michigan State? Which has obviously given Penn State similar problems over the years. So you've got an argument, but I I was just taken aback by that. I just uh, was not to, not sure how to handle it. I think uh, I guess there's an argument for it, but yeah, we'll we'll go with that. But so so, so it's sorry. the closest. It's the closest thing. There is not one. And yes, I understand what you're saying here. Uh, Iowa is not Penn State's rival. But if we're going to say who gives them good games consistently, 
Iowa gives them good games consistently. It's a it's wrong. a close competitive series. Yeah, you're not wrong there. That that's uh, that's for sure. Um, and it's and it's funny just how for how much they struggled against Iowa in the early 2000s, and then they kind of flipped it on its head in the, late late in the last decade. The COVID year is, is the COVID year, but then yeah. you got the close game in uh, 2021. So, so yes, um, it, 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 they traditionally have been good games. You, you, you know, if you're attending the whiteout via Tixman gym this weekend, uh, you would like to see more of that. Uh, that was 2016 when they just ran them yeah. out of the building. That was, uh, that's what you're looking for on Saturday night. So, but uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, you've, you've got an argument there, but anyway, sorry. I was just so taken aback by that. I know Drew Aller, <laughs> Drew yeah, Aller <laughs> talking about the other one. Um, yeah. I mean, he's uh Look, he, he was in his first start on the road, and I think he showed it. Um, you you looked at him. Um, first off, receivers not open. I think the receivers were a big problem in this game, and that's that is probably even magnified when, when rewatching it is that there, he didn't have guys to throw to, and when he yeah. did, yeah, there were drops. You know, you're, you're not going to want those. Um, so you've got to continue to build that confidence. You've got to first off make those. I mean, Malik McLean, not to harp on it too much. You got to make those catches because it's not even yeah. a it's not even a contested catch. Um, so there was some of that. I think there was a little bit of uh, finding uh, finding the Illinois defensive line because they were all over the place. Um, not not just um, coming after him on the uh, on the pass rush, but like pre snap, like finding those guys, keying where that pass pass rush is going to come from. And I think his eyes were down a little bit. Like you watch mm-hmm. the the West Virginia and the uh, Delaware game, and of course Delaware being what it is. Um, but his eyes were downfield. He was comfortable looking down the field, feeling where, feeling out where he was going to be. Now he did make some good runs. He did make some good decisions to take off and run a couple of times. Um, but I think his his eyes were a little bit down a little. Uh, and and you know that I think that's going to have sort of a chain reaction to the footwork. Um, like a guy said in the post game show the other day, he thought he was throwing off his back foot. I think he was just throwing off an uneven platform a lot. And he's got the arm strength to do that more than most. But still. You know he's he's a quarterback. He's got to have mechanics. So I think that's really what sort of a trickle down effect. And again, why can't the receivers get open? I, I don't know. T. Frank, you probably watched those guys a little bit closer um, mm-hmm. than I did on the rewatch. But they really missed Trey Wallace uh, the other day. And I think that was one of my main takeaways from the game is that that guy um, for what we didn't know that he was going to be. We also didn't know that he was going to be as consistent as he was in the first couple of weeks. Cause of course he had the drop problems last year. He's had a drop or two this year, but he's been the guy that drew looks to on the sideline for those out routes that extend drives and, and move the chain. So I think that Trey Wallace missed more than most. He warmed up, he was there, so he's got to be close to playing. Um, but, uh, Penn state's really going to need him back this weekend. Yeah, and just a, a quick couple things covered in T. Frank's film room, which we got to yesterday at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. Great reason to sign up. Just a small plug there. But the it was a couple of things, especially to, to hone in on the receivers specifically. Um, Keandre Lambert-Smith, physicality uh, and press coverage, that is still an issue for him. We, we had that question coming in. Would being in the slot take that away? He didn't have a lot of opportunities to be in the slot. Uh, necessarily, but when he did, it didn't really go all that well for him. And then Illinois, I'll go back to this. It's it's about the run game. The run game, again, if you want to set up the expectations, Kansas was able to spread them out laterally, which brought them closer to the line of scrimmage, which opened bigger holes in the secondary. Without that threat, they were not able to do as much and get as open and have as many uh, open targets, but when they did fits, I mean, like Dante Cephas on a crossing route, that was that was a good route. Tyler Warren on a crossing route, they were able to get open eventually, but it's just the consistency of getting them to that situation without Jason Newton barreling down on Drew Aller in every situation. Uh, Nate, I want to come to you about this conversation about the receivers and the passing game. What did you see from uh, the team when you were there in terms of how they were using receivers, how they're cycling guys through without Trey Wallace? Yeah. It, well, it became a line change, right? I mean, it became a wave of just trying to figure it out. I mean, but th- at least in the second half, uh, certainly in the first half, I thought that they were trying to do some things. Yeah. Um, look, I, I thought that Keandre Lambert Smith took himself out of the game a little bit after some early miscues, that, right? Things that didn't go well. I, I just noticed and this is where I get a little bit uncomfortable because you don't want to, you don't want to dig too deep into it. Right. But reading body language, I didn't think it was great uh, after some of those things happened there in the first quarter. I mean, obviously yeah. Aller missed him deep at one point. Um, but then just later on, you just, you just didn't quite see it. Um, you, you know, and then for the, the rest of those guys, like, yeah, Malik McLean, that's, those are, 
those are two pretty key drops, right? I mean, they, they had, uh, I think they were attributed with five drops among those receivers um, on, on Saturday. That's like, th- to be honest with you, my, my kind of hot take here is that Aller actually wasn't all that bad. Like he, he made yeah. some winning plays. He, he made some great pass. Like, did he, did he throw everything perfectly? No, but there were some plays that he made running the ball, what, what have you to kind of keep the chains moving that w- that were good. Also, he made some spectacular passes that weren't caught. And then he also made some passes that, right. Like who, who do you charge the batted balls to, right? Is that, right. is that Aller's fault? Is that, is that the offensive line? Is it just a great play by a really good uh, defensive line that, that Illinois has. So I, I kind of saw it. It's, we always want to, you know, kind of point the finger at one thing. And Saturday to me felt in many ways, like it was just really a lot of different stuff, a lot of different stuff going on that yeah. it, it like, was the offensive line terrible? I actually didn't think so. <laughs> I thought, I thought they did uh, okay. In most instances, it was just a matter of the opponent that they were playing as well as if you've got, if you've got, you're playing seven offensive linemen, eight offensive linemen, and each guy makes one mistake or half of those guys make one mistake. It makes everyone look bad, even though it's really just, you know, it's not a terrible day for each one of those guys, but collectively it looks, it looks worse than it really is. Yeah. One one of the things that I thought happened and yeah, you know, I'll just get to this briefly of like, there were things that Illinois was doing from a coverage standpoint that was fooling Penn state pre-snap. And that caused them to run some kind of dead looks, running the wrong play into the defense and what the defense was giving them after the snap. And as you mentioned, uh, Drew Eller made a lot of great decisions to not throw the football in those situations. Fitz, I want to come to you uh, on this particular conversation because you mentioned throwing off his back foot, maybe not being as sound as he has been in the past. But how, how do you... I, I, have a, I have a hard time of exactly how to phrase this of he... Never got rattled, but his footwork got worse. Like, how do you put that into context of he still what what you saw from him in terms of that on Saturday? Yeah, I think that's that's probably the confidence roller coaster when you talk about it, like riding that wave, and then it, it and then it, it has that chain reaction where it gets away from you a little bit, and then all of a sudden you're trying to press a little bit. You're not having, um, excuse me, you're not having a situation where you're in a rhythm so you're trying to create a rhythm and you saw that you saw his face after McLean dropped that second ball it's like come on man like what what are we doing here and and that's that's where it starts to spiral and it didn't spiral out of control but it you know it gets away from you a little bit and I think that that's really what he dealt with and and not having Wallace out there to consistently catch that 12 yard out that he throws yep. better than anybody in college football really I think is is one of those things that that was a rhythm breaker so yeah, I think going back, it's it's not you know you see forty eight percent in the completion percentage, and it's not it it was not that bad of an effort by by Drew, but there was also yep. just no like the rest of the game, not not just with Drew, there's just no rhythm to it whatsoever. And going back and watching the tape as it is the every single week because we don't know what we're looking at with offensive line. Uh, the offensive line was not as bad as it was, um, at, you know, bad at what as it was proclaimed after the game. A couple misses here and there. The, the interesting thing when, when I went back and looked, it was it was very, and and I've had this this theory before where Penn State, when it knows it's better than another team, it calls the game as if it's better than another team, yeah. to try and figure out, like try and grasp what they are. Like we saw it, we saw it last week with Delaware running inside. Like you you could have run outside and you could have scored. You know, Nick Singleton could have bounced something outside and scored an eighty yard touchdown. That's not what they're trying to do. This week, you're seeing eight, nine in the box. You're saying not not how do I get out of this, but how do I beat this? And yeah. they didn't, number one. Um, but as, as you mentioned in your in your um, in your film room piece, like the running game was better than than you would have thought. So that's just kind of my working theory is like, are you just trying to get your stuff in or are you is this going to be an ongoing issue, especially with a defense as well coached as uh, as Iowa's defense coming in next weekend? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really great point. And that's part of the conversation going into the game is what do they have that could attack this particular defense? And it was, well, we're going to run what we run. And that's that's what happened. Now, it wasn't completely we're going to run what we run. I think they still tried to get outside a little bit on this team, but within the confines of what they do, they didn't make up something new for the most part for that game. And I want to fold this in here. Both of you guys have kind of given your opinion on here, but KJ Johnson, he's back here. Uh, uh, on the Monday show, Newton, obviously an elite player, impressive performance Saturday, but did you see some red flags with the O-line that could linger all season? I wouldn't even say all season, guys. The, the Newton got there on a lot of stunts coming from one gap to the other, and no one was surprised by that. He Not only is he a good player, but that is something Penn State has struggled with consistently this year. I didn't even get into a lot of the breaking down of that play because what they were doing in the coverage was hold up long enough so that he can affect the play. Because it was coming. Like, we all knew that particular part was coming. So is that, some, is that something you guys are concerned with? Or is Drew Aller good enough that he can overcome that, do you think? And he, the, the burden is now on the quarterback to evade the pressure because it's not, it's not from every direction, but there definitely is going to be pressure in certain situations. Fit, well, what uh, what do you think, Fitz? Every direction, excuse me. It's not from every direction. And that, I think that's the key thing here is, like, Newton killed them, but, like, who else killed them? There was a couple of good efforts um, from that Illinois defense, which I think, you know, they, they lost a ton from last year. I think they played better. Um, then they played all season, which is a credit to them. Um, but at the same time, I think he, they weren't dangerous enough to hurt you from every angle. He wasn't slipping away from Newton and then finding another defender. He was slipping yeah. away from Newton and then finding four yards forward to put them in second and six. Um, you know, and, and, and while we're there down a distance, you know, it was not Penn State's best day in terms of staying on schedule and doing what they needed to do to, um, you know, really move that football. They won time of possession, of course. Um, I, I think the the numbers were fairly balanced between Penn State and Illinois, but that fourth quarter, I think Illinois, you know, kind of padded, I don't want to say pad their stats, but they did a nice job of adding yards. Of course, they added that late score. So I don't think it was as even as the the stat book will show. But but yeah, I think I think there's there's something to that. The stunts have been an issue for years and it really, you know, sort of uh, it, it, it translates over several offensive line coaches, several offensive uh, coordinators. Right. It, they're, they're hard to pick up like number one, but you have to have some sort of a semblance on on what's possibly coming. I mean, you've far too often there are guys where or there are plays where there's a guy just, uh, you know, surveying his area and with not does does not have the periphery to give a hand. No, sorry, we're in the middle screen here. So give a hand and, uh, you know, take a side shot on somebody like that. There, there we go. It just there we go. a little bit of that. Um, so so I think that that's, uh, you know, an awareness issue and something that they need to to clean up. And and again, I was going to attack them in multiple ways this year. Uh, this weekend, the, this year, their defense is, is an Iowa defense. It's it's very, very, very much an Iowa defense as it is an Iowa offense. And um, Andrew Callahan, Callahan and I used to joke all the time, it's it's your father's Iowa team. It's your grandfather's Iowa team. It's the same Iowa team every every yeah. year. And, and you're you're going to get that again this weekend. And, and again, a, as well coach as any defense in the Big Ten, they're going to try and surprise Drew, um, confuse Drew. And, uh, you know, that offensive line is, is going to have to – um, probably make some adjustments. You look at that West Virginia game. There was there was some max protect early there just to get him comfortable to keep yep. Theo in, and that's of course has has taken a, a hit on the tight end targets. But probably going to have to do a little bit of that this weekend, at least early in the game, to to get him comfortable to get him where he needs to be. Yeah, that that's been a big theme of of the twelve personnel and how they've used those guys in the passing attack. Want to clean one thing up, just as Nate said earlier, the day that Drew Aller had compared to the day that it said in the stat book. So if we look at his, um, first off, there were, let me, I just had this here, four drops uh, charged to the Penn State receivers according to PFF, and a that brings his adjusted completion percentage up to 66%. It's not 92 like it was the beginning of the season, but 66% is a quality day from a quarterback who's having a bad day. So not nearly as bad as it seems overall, but uh, one of the things that we, we will transition here from Drew Aller and his using his legs to get out of those situations and helping the Penn State rushing attack into the Penn State rushing attack. Nate, how did you feel about this in the moment and what did you learn after the game talking to the guys about the performance of that group and um, how they were how they did what they did on Saturday? Yeah, Clearly there was some frustration, right? Uh, Singleton acknowledged after the game that, you know, how much of a, re you could see it, right? The, the release of emotion that, you know, coincided with his touchdown run just because he had been running into nothing for, for, for most of the day. I mean, look, if you, yeah. if you go back uh, 
to me, in some ways, I, I understand the Trey Potts touchdown was the play of the game, but the play of the game to set that up was Singleton's 19 yard kind of swing pass, right? At, earlier in that possession there in the third quarter. Was that right? the one so, out of the T? Is that? I don't remember the formation. I just, I just, uh, I think it was a two receiver backfield. Okay. They had two receivers. It wasn't the T, but they had two, they had two running backs in the backfield on that gotcha. play. Point, point just being that when he had the ball in space, he did things with it. Right. And so it wasn't all that often, but he's still a playmaker that, that drive in general was filled with the best players making plays, right? They, they, that was a third and one that, that he did that on, uh, you know? And so had he, had they not been able to complete that play and kind of move the ball there, you were looking at three, three and outs and a five and out in, in terms of their second half possessions at that point. So it, it just, it just was a, a real turning point. It felt to me that they were able to move the ball in that situation yeah, I I felt in some ways as though they knew they were running into a brick wall a, a little bit, right? They, but you still feel so good about some of those guys and their ability to make plays even in those conditions that you're going to you're going to do it, right? You're going you're going to take a shot at that because sometimes Mike Yersich said it this summer. I don't have the quote in front of me. I was looking for it. But I mean, he said that sometimes that's still the best play, right? It, 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 it's not the best play in terms of yeah. conventionality, but it is the best play because these guys are electric. They they are your playmakers and you want to give them the ball even in not ideal situations sometimes. So yeah, it just, it, I don't think that, you know, cause, cause I thought that your was a little bit of a, a guy that, that uh, had the finger pointed at him after the game. I didn't yeah. think, I didn't think it was as simple as they didn't try things. I, I did think they tried things. Yep, they, they tried a lot of different stuff. It just wasn't always successful. And one thing here or there, right? Again, to that that mass feeling of just everyone did something wrong, even if it wasn't a a bad day for every individual. Everyone did something wrong, and so because of that, it just it just looked worse than it was. Uh, question here in the chat talking about Nick Singleton. Good football player, really good football player. The question, though, here, T. Frank, is it just me or does Nick Singleton's role to make people miss? He doesn't have a hole. He uses his speed. There's no wiggle to make linebackers or safeties miss. These are the stats. Uh, he has three missed tackles on the season. In the Big Ten, that puts him tied for 25th. Uh, the leader here is Kyle Manungai from Rutgers, who has 18. Um, so that's the scale you hear. You got Braylon Allen, uh, Catron Allen has, he's tied for ninth with eight. So that is, I think part of the conversation about the running game is, uh, are you running into bad looks? And then if you do get a look, are you making the most out of it? And Catron Allen breaking that tackle to get down to the goal line for the game breaking, uh, pass that uh, the halfback pass that set up the, you know, setting up that touchdown part of the conversation as well. Um, is that something you're concerned about, Nate? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, uh, moving forward, is it three games in now, just given the, the, the fact that they really have not broken the kind of that home run, uh, you know, that, that they are being made to work for it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's kind of the, the point of this, right. Is you it, like the blueprints out there, you, you know, how teams are going to defend, this Penn state offense, they're, they're going to make life difficult for both of those running backs. And so, yes, it is incumbent on the backs themselves to make the play when the opportunity comes. I, I don't think that they've been either one of them really particularly opp opportunistic, right? That, that is, has been, but also it's almost like, uh, you know, the, it, this is so stupid. Everybody's going to kill me for this, but Barry yeah, bonds, well. right? Like, back when he was hitting a bajillion home runs, it was, Oh, you're going to get one pitch to hit a game. And yeah. that's what he did was he hit a home run with that pitch. That that's kind of the scenario that they're facing right now is they're going to get one pitch to hit a game. And so far they haven't been able to to do that with it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. It's also going to be incumbent on 
on Drew Aller and the receivers combined, the, the, the two of them, the tight ends as well, Mike Yursich, to help soften that, to help, to help, you know, alleviate those conditions and change some of the looks that they're running into. Uh, Fitz, I don't want to belabor the point of Nick Singleton, bad runner, but I also just want to get your your thoughts on the running game and, and starting at that point, then we can move on to the offensive line and examine some different parts. But, you know, just generally with this conversation, how, what is your view on the performance so far from the running game and the lack of explosive plays? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a balanced thing with Nick. Like he gets, he he wants to get that 80-yard touchdown run and he's moving forward in a, in a sense that, that, that if he gets by that guy, he's gone. And... He has not gotten by that guy, and that, that that's something he needs to improve upon. Um, you, you you hate to say run a little bit more upright, but run a little bit more balanced, and and he'll be okay. We've seen him do it before. Um, a, a, a lot of his carries, you know, as they continue to try and make him an all around inside runner, a lot of his carries are going into three four guys. So he's not yeah. going to break a tackle there. It's just that he needs to make the most of his opportunity. And I will say, Nate's Barry Bonds count comparison, not bad. Not bad. Hey. Like it's, it, I, I, you have done exponentially worse in terms of comparisons. So, um, <laughs> I will, I will say not bad on that. But yeah, it, it is certainly something he can improve upon. And it, it, it's interesting that they've started to get him the ball a little bit more in space as a receiver, and he's really worked on that and done a nice job of improving as a receiver. Um, and that's really when he's been in his best for Penn State this year. And uh, I'd be curious to see if there was uh, there was a comment in the chat. I actually said this uh, said this the other day. Um, a little bit more under center running to get him that head of steam and get yeah. him going. It, it's it's a it's a little bit simplistic, but there's something to that. Like it's it's kind of what he's I don't want to say used to, but that's kind of the I think the way that he sees the field best. And think about that uh, that Rose Bowl run. I mean, there's there's certainly things things you see things differently when you're coming from that angle. So I think there's something to that. There's been a little bit of he used to do one thing in high school, and they've transitioned in more into being a part of the playbook instead of, hey, we're going to run you in runs that you're familiar with. So I think this is part of that transition as well of making him a running back and not a specialist that we're catering to. You've got to run the base plays. Nate, you had a comment. You had a thought. Well, I, I was just going to say this is this is extraordinarily layman's take on it, but it almost feels to me as though he's being too patient at times. Yes. Right. And so he's yes. he's it's almost like this development, this trajectory of becoming a a real running back mm -hmm. of like picking your holes and, and just waiting it out. But also that he has missed the hole because of it, right? He, he has been so patient in waiting for some of this stuff to develop that things that are super easy to see from the press box, uh, right. May are, are windows that have closed shortly thereafter. So it, it I, I don't know, like whether or not it's, it's getting him going. Oops, sorry, I, I mean a trampoline. I think there's something to the fact that he's a really good goal line runner. Like he's a, yep. he's, a he's better than you expect. You expect Katron Allen to be the bigger, stronger goal line runner, but Nick gets the ball and gets there in a hurry. And he did it on that touchdown run the other day. Is like he found it and he and he raced through there. And there's an element of what Nate's saying in that he's too patient when he's outside the twenty and beyond. And maybe that's hurting him in terms of his production. Like I, he's a better goal line you know i know the t formation is fantastic but he's a better goal line back than i think any of us expected just because he never had that uh that big back build that big 10 big 10 back build where he I and mean, he's still 222 pounds he's the same size as katron allen but, but we he's don't tall. think of him in that yeah. way yeah we don't think of him in that way so i think that there's something to that and that at the goal line there's no time to think about it there's no time to, to go for it and you just you find your objective which is getting past that wide stripe and he does yeah. that really well he in the a hammer field, He's, yeah, in the open field, he's got more time to uh, to process that, and that might not be the best thing. Yeah, he. I think that you guys have kind of nailed it there when you look at like he's trying to be patient. He's try, but his nature is to run through people, and it's it's funny watching him and like going through the history and the litany of Penn State running backs. And I always looked at Saquon Barkley, Barkley, and I said, I wish you had a little bit more Nick Singleton in you. You know, of like lower your shoulder, don't try to bounce everything. But he made special things happen. And Nick is so patient that you want to go. I wish you had a little more Saquon Barkley in you, where you would just go, "I'm the better athlete, make a cut and and explode." And and there's there's he's learning. Like that is kind of like the Abdul Carter conversation we had from week one. He's in his second year. He's learning. These are the growing pains of becoming a better uh, football player. So you here's it, a you heard it here first. Penn State needs a Saquon Barkley and Nick Singleton combination. Is what they yes. Need. 
<laughs> Get it together, guys. <laughs> it's be- okay. Listen, they are both so talented that you just have a you have a higher expectation. You want them to be the best version of themselves. That's for all. sure. Absolutely. Uh, Chris, this is a great this is a great conversation to get into talking about the offensive line. Is it time to sit Caden Wallace? Is it time to start, <laughs> start uh, Shelton at right tackle? Chris, no, it is not. But let's have a, let's have a conversation about the offensive line. <laughs> uh, Nate, I want to come to you. I'm going to drop this hot potato in your lap. Uh, okay. What do you think of the offensive line? Uh, you can you can answer that question if you'd like. But let's talk about the Penn State uh, running game and and the effect of the offensive line on that group up front and what uh, maybe was hidden and maybe what we didn't see from that perspective. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure that I have a developed opinion, to be honest with you. I, I think that I didn't think they were glaringly bad. And maybe, maybe I just missed that, but I just didn't think that it was that type of a day for, for the offensive line. I thought that Newton played really well. I thought he's a really good player, and he gave them problems. They had other players on that defensive line that gave them problems because they're good. <laughs> right? Like that, that's, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out that balance of it doesn't make you horrible j- because you're playing a good opponent. I, I just There has to be a little bit of a give and take there. And I felt like there was, to a certain extent, I, I don't know, was was Aller under pressure all day? I, I don't, I don't know. I didn't think like it was that bad. He was hit was, once. He was not sacked. So yeah, there there were pressures there. There were some circumstances uh, that that right that they got the best of them. Uh, but I I certainly don't feel as though like there has to be a middle ground between this offensive line and its trajectory in the program over the years, right? As having made improvement and expect expectations being that they're dominant and just run over everybody. Right. Yeah. If, if that was the expectation, I don't think we said that. I'm not sure who would have said that it, it's just, that's just not the conditions of, of who they are, but are, comparatively speaking to what they have been in the past are they pretty good yeah and and i w- would expect them to continue to be that way so i'm i'm not in any manner hitting a panic button on what this this offensive line is i do think that that landon tangwall is missed and right like the best yep. version of landon tangwall if we, if that ever would have been the case this season i think that that is missed so far but outside of that uh yeah i, I don't think Olufe, you know, I'm reading these comments. Like, I don't think Olufashanu is dropping out of the first day of the NFL draft. Like, I just, Let's I'm give, just, I'm not seeing that. Can I give a, a bit of perspective on this? Because this happened one, once again. We give you the PFF snap counts and the grades that come out immediately after at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. And there is a part of this conversation I think is is uh, factored around that. And we've we've highlighted, hey, Olu's not the best run blocker. Um, but that do, like that doesn't take away from the fact that he is a really good pass protector. He allowed one pressure last week uh, on Saturday. So this is not like the sky is falling. He wasn't great as a run blocker, but his money is being made as an elite pass protector. He still did that. Fitz, um, just another note here. Caden Wallace, Penn State's best pass protector, allowing zero pressures. Um, there were some issues in the run game. There were some times that I think it, well, that'll be adjusted a little bit here once you get to some of those uh, reviews. But he was not bad. Um, fits with, with the with the run game and opening holes and and getting the running backs to the second level. Sometimes, to me, like we're missing some of the stuff on the inside because, as you mentioned, we don't know what we're looking at. Hunter Norzad apparently had a pretty good day as a run blocker, and yet no one would know that because it, it just it doesn't always show up as an offensive lineman. If I may go, Nate, here and get perspective on you, we know the least about offensive line play in terms of actual, just physical play, in terms Mm -hmm. of scheme, in terms of what they're trying to do. So when somebody comes through the line of scrimmage and gets back there, it must mean O-line bad. Like, And so we we know the least about it, but we can complain the most about it because it's tangible. We see it right in front of us that somebody's in the backfield. Okay, that's great. Um, getting beyond that and going back to the tape, yeah, these guys, they were not bad. Like there was, there were certainly things that they can improve upon. Uh, T Frank, you hit on, on that in your film room, but it, it's the same thing every week. It's like, Hey, this offensive line sucks. 
go back and watch. Not too bad. Like yeah. so, I just I just want to curtail some of the knee jerk reactions and 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 again and and admit that yes, there are things that they need to improve upon getting to the second level. Like the the combo blocking has been an issue for Penn State just to to get off that first block and get to the second level. We go back to the running game with with Nick Singleton. You pin that linebacker and or even a safety or something like that. You've got yourself a, a an advantageous matchup for those running backs. They just haven't had all that much and all that much space. And again, numbers, man, like it's, it's not, I saw this on the board the other day. It's not an opinion that Illinois stacked the box. That was eight, nine players in the box, which is just kind of ludicrous. And Penn state continued to try and run into it. It's not an offensive line issue. That is a scheme Penn state play calling issue. Um, So would like to see a little bit more in terms of the diversity from Mike Yurcich. Again, I think from the outside in, I think Harrison Wallace or Trey Wallace is, is going to make a difference when he comes back because they seemed to be more comfortable, uh, you know, getting the ball out in the air. I think playing on the road in the first start, there's something to that, to protecting the ball, to not having Drew throw interceptable passes. T Frank, I don't know if you have the the stats in front of you, if he threw an interceptable ball, I think there may be one that uh, got away from him. But other than that, like, I think that that all goes into it. And that is, is certainly something that, uh, you know, cannot be taken for granted. Has, has Penn State turned the ball over this year? Like, is that, is that been a thing so far? Um, I, I mean, they, they've taken extremely good care of the ball, even though they, they've just been on the road once. I know that that kind of that minimizes my uh, my imp- or my my argument there, but that's that's kind of what we're seeing with this offense is is staying out of harm's way, yep. and you do that long enough, and and you're okay. And and again, look across the country, man. Penn State had a 17 point win where Boston College took Florida State to the to the line, South Florida took Alabama to the line, Wyoming had Texas not on the ropes, but whatever they say in Texas down there. Um, but this is this is a situation where Penn State was able to to, to fight through and, and get a 17 point win, and and college football. It's there are some really good teams. College football is not perfect, and that's what makes it from week to week so much fun to, to cover and to, to watch for fans. This is uh, this is the the conversation Fitz and I had uh, privately before the game. Uh, Kyle LeBaron asks Bo Package. Initially, I thought they'd put him in early. Looking back, do you think that Bo Package was also a way to run the clock, which would have struggled? Uh, they'd have struggled to uh, in the past, or is that just reps? I want to just talk about the Bo Perbula package because going back to stacking the box and looking at some of the things that you can do with a running quarterback against an eight or nine man box fits. I, I, what I said to you was like, if there's a week to have the Bo Perbula package, it's this one. They're going to need it in the run game to create math and, and numbers and angles. Um, but as you mentioned, Mike, you're not necessarily interested in doing that. They want to run the offense that drew can run. Yeah, and and as long as Franklin here is here, the quarterback is quarterback run is going to be a part of the scheme. Like he yeah. wants to run the quarterback. He knows that this is not the smartest thing to do with Drew Aller because of his skill set. Because but but it's still going to be there. Um, also, it was a great time for the bow package because that game might still be going on if if it <laughs> did not happen. So hats off to Prabula for running that clock down. Um, but no, I, I think it's it's one of those things where you get we talk about how different the playbook would be if you went with Bo versus we went with drew and and you saw it on saturday just the yeah just those little lanes i mean things open up a little bit more when you have that quarterback run at your disposal now would, would like to see a i don't want to say a little less quarterback run but like a little bit more uh diversity you knew what was coming when Bo was in there and that i think that's yeah. the that's the issue if he does happen to have to go into a game when it's in doubt that's the issue that you're going to face is are you too comfortable running the stuff that you're very comfortable running versus what you're going to need to win the game? That's that's the question that I have about the Pergula package. So I, I, I'd i love to see him throw it a little bit more. I'd love to see him, you know, work it around with his backs and, and see those guys run. Um, I, I think it's great that he got in there when he did. I think it's great getting him a series or two with that first team offensive line because if, I mean, nobody wants to say, it, but if they need it like that, that is going to be helpful in the long run. Yeah. But uh that, that that's the difference, man. That's the difference between the Clifford and the per, Cliffords and the Perbulas in the world. And then on the flip side, uh, that throw to Liam Clifford down the line of scrimmage. That's the difference between the Aller and the and and the uh, the yeah. alternative there. Yeah, and and that throw to Liam Clifford is what you need to get those points in clutch situations. So we could spend a whole show talking about the Penn State offense and the things that we saw, but we're only going to spend three quarters of a show. <laughs> Let's talk about Perfect. the Penn State defense because this group. 
uh, was pretty dominant. Now, there is a little bit of like it's cut and dried of, wow, they, they got five turnovers. And if you want to talk about complimentary football, they were as complimentary of the offense as they possibly could be. Nate, I want to come to you. Start us yep. with a great big picture Nate Bauer view of how the defense played and your thoughts coming out of this game about how they were tested and how they responded. Yeah, I think the I think the familiar version of needing a drive to figure the opponent out was what happened a little bit, right? They uh, Illinois yeah. moved the ball, obviously that first possession that they had. Uh, you know, I think that we're talking about this game in completely different terms if Penn State scores a touchdown when it gets to the two-yard line on that first takeaway, right? So after that first takeaway, if, if, if Penn State scores there uh, or, or a touchdown on the next one, like right? They, did, they, were, they were gifted so such good field position that because the offense didn't do that, you're like, oh, well, you know, the defense is playing great, but you know, the offense isn't maximizing it. Uh, I, I did think a, a thing that is not being mentioned is it looked to me, I'm not sure what the broadcast showed, but Altmaier got hurt or yes. kind of early. He came up yep. a little bit lame in, in an him earlier. Low. What's that? Vanover got him low. I think he, it was not called. It was, he was blocked into him. I think they determined. And after that, he was not a threat at all. But I just, play. I, I thought that changed the complexion a little bit for, for what Illinois does, what he does, how, you know, why that makes him a little bit of a dangerous quarterback. And so at, at, you know, there became a point where you're literally just, you're just taking right. They're so, they're so one dimensional um, that it, it was just a, a little bit of easy pickings. Look, they, this is a team that wanted to be a ball hawking defense and yep. I think teams have made that difficult for them. You still are seeing, uh, you know, some difficulty in terms of how quickly Illinois was getting the ball out, right? The sack numbers still are not there or were not there for the, the stars, right? That that trio yeah. of defensive ends that Penn State has. But all in all, it, yeah, it was, it was a great effort. The cornerbacks had a really nice day. Uh, Zaki Wheatley had a, a great opportunity that he, he just barely missed. That's what you want, right? I mean, that's that I, I expect that these are the conditions that Penn State is going to have for quite a few games this season. Uh, again, simply based on very lazy stereotypes that I have for horrible offense that is played in the Big Ten. <laughs> it, it just, yeah. That's, just that's where we started. That's where we started. And Fitz, I want to ask you this. Of This was a conversation I had um, on the internet during the game after a fourth interception where a defensive back ran the route for the receiver. They're trying to throw a back shoulder throw and Johnny Dixon is the one getting the back shoulder throw. This was an elite performance from the secondary, but then the conversation is it's Illinois. Calm down. That's not an elite squad. If you it, if you it's... suffocate somebody, that's an elite performance, right? How do you balance like what we saw from as Nate said, they're one dimensional, but they destroyed them. It's so funny to hear the conversation because it's it's almost like given where those players were when they got the interceptions that they don't count because right. And hey, Luke Altmaier found those guys wide open. Let's be honest here, but like those guys are confident enough and talented enough to be in the spots that they needed to be. Um, you know, Abdul Carter again hit what three tackles the other day, but was awesome, like all over the place, um, including that drop where he had the interception. Um, those cornerbacks, uh, they were in the right spots more often than not, and and it, it took till the end till till an Illinois receiver made a play on a ball. Um, and that was, you know, the game was already out of, out of hand. So, that, I mean, you, you can't have it both, man. <laughs> you can't have this defense is struggling to contain Garrett Green against West Virginia, and uh, they're they're not what we thought they were. Or this defense had four, what five five takeaways, but you know, yeah. Illinois kind of gave the ball, so it doesn't really do anything. Like this is this is the mark of a confident defense. Is a mark of good defense, and, and I think having that defense as confident as they are, especially with an offense that is traditionally as lamented as Iowa's is like, that's a, that's a recipe for, for more good things to happen this weekend. And I'm, I'm curious to see how that, uh, how that sort of boils over because Penn state's doing well. And, and even the spots and, you know, Nate mentioned that, uh, the defensive ends really don't have haven't had an impact on the stat sheet, but you look back and Adisa I thought played excellent. Thought yep. Chop played better than you would expect. Like 
you you've seen chop stat line and you think he hasn't done anything but you'll you go back and watch the tape very active like very active against the run too yep. um very active all over the place so i think that those i think it's more of a matter of time with those things the question that i have um for for iowa's offense is that's not a traditional get the ball out quick type thing and that's hurt them in the past and they've taken some sack numbers in the past and i'm curious to see if this is the week where you can press on and you can get those numbers that you're looking for of course mcnamara you know a little bit uh, a little bit mobile as well um but at the same time like you've you know, you you have a pretty good idea of what they're going to bring at you. So I'm curious to see the steps that they make from a five turnover performance against Illinois to coming back home, playing in that atmosphere where they're going to be juiced, like beyond juiced up. And, yeah. you know, maybe you get one of those Altmaier throws coming your way uh, from McNamara this weekend. And, and that changes the entire complexity of this game. A point that was made on the message board, I think it was after the game or during the game, is that the presence of the defensive ends is the fact that no one will hold on to the football. Um, and when they did in this game, by the way, going into this game, Penn State had seen the sixth fewest passing attempts in all of college football. They saw 44 on Friday and they got four interceptions. So the, the, and, and from a pass rushing perspective, a couple other numbers for you, Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac, we highlighted this on the Friday show. They had two combined pressures in the first two games. They had 10 together in this game, including, including Adisa Isaac, who had a sack and two quarterback hits. So they showed up in terms of maybe not sacks, which are what everyone sees. And that's the obvious thing. But Chop Robinson was getting around the edge. He was getting pressure. Just that was forcing uh, Luke Altmaier into those interceptions. So it becomes, what, are, what do you want? Do you want interceptions or do you want sacks? Because you can't have both on the same play. Um, but if I had dramatic music, I would play it now because we're going to talk about the Penn State run defense. Nate, what did you think of the Penn State run you defense? Had like the law and order tone toned up or, or <laughs> chewed up or anything? The, 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 the. Unfortunately, not. Uh, what did I think about the Penn State run defense? I thought they were good. I, I don't know. I were there were there moments? Sure. I, I thought that Illinois had right Reggie Love that whenever he scored. I guess that, I mean that was in the second half. At that point. Um, it was a two-run right, day for Reggie, Reggie Love. It was the touchdown, and it was the twenty-yarder on third and twenty-three, where Penn State was not defending it at all, and, and it showed. Right. I mean, to, to yeah. his credit, it showed. Right. I, I just, I just, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering sometimes where the standard is for expectations because I, I, I do think overall, I don't think there was really any question that uh, that Penn State was highly effective defense defensively on on saturday i just i there were not complaints right for 62 yards of rushing i i guess adjusted for sacks it's a little bit less than that or or tackles for loss um but yeah it was it was a good day for for penn state's run defense uh defensive tackles are always the conversation um i thought they played well you can always go through a game and find somebody trip over somebody else's foot and then get shoved to the ground. Uh, that happens quite regularly in football. Maybe there are a couple of opportunities for Penn State's defensive tackles to stonewall some runs, but overall, I thought they got penetration. I thought they played well. Fitz, what was your view of that? Uh, you know, those defensive tackles and how they performed with Kazai Izzard back out there and having the complement of guys on the interior that they were expecting at the beginning of the year. Yeah, you beat me to the punch with Izzard. I think he gives you something physically in there that you clearly were missing in the first two weeks. And I don't think they were bad in the first two weeks, but it's it gives you something a little bit more to play off, especially for a guy like Beeman um, to, to put a bigger guy in, in there beside him. I know it's not all about size and complementary styles and everything like that, but to, to have that there is, is really, I think, going to help him out. Uh, I think Durant went out late with an injury, so... I have to watch him this week and make sure he's 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 active. But you have that opportunity this week to have a more complete defensive line. And I think Izzard's a big part of it. And by the way, after one game, he leads the team in sacks, which is really, really funny to me. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Um, uh, Rob Sherrill says over 300 yards in 2021, this meaning the uh, Iowa or Illinois rushing def uh, rushing offense under 100 on Saturday. Maybe some people don't think that's progress. If you're one of those people, I can't help you. Rob, this is a point, and, you know, we – I, I fail. I, I declined to get annoyed at Gus Johnson uh, on Saturday afternoon after the game. But one of the things that really bothered me is Joel Klatt's making our job harder because every single thing that happened, he goes, well, how does this compare to what's going to happen against Ohio State and Michigan? And that is the problem is like any little problem that shows up, it becomes well against Michigan. That's a touchdown. And it's 
somebody i mean some, we're gonna have to find his on our, on our web on our board i mean because that's is he, is he like <laughs> between plays is he posting on our board because that's basically <laughs> what it is um, somebody somebody basically echoed that on on the board just saying you know bottom line here is that if penn state plays the way that they played against illinois they're not going to beat ohio state or michigan and it's like you're telling me, you mean to tell me that if Penn State doesn't play its best game of the season or one of its better games of the season against one of the better opponents that they face during the season that they're not going to win? Oh my goodness. What a what a brilliant insight. This is this is <laughs> fabulous stuff. I can't get over it. I just like again, me with the references, but if you can go out, like they talk about it in golf all the time. If you can go out there without your best stuff and still shoot par or under par, like that's, that is what it takes. That is what it takes to be very, very successful in golf. In football, it's, it's somewhat the same thing, right? If you cannot have your best stuff, and this was a discombobulated game for all over the place, right? Yursich, the offensive line, the running backs, Aller, uh, defensively was great. I thought they were pretty good. But point being, if you can be lacking in a lot of areas and not at your tip top shape, even if you are very much trying to be the, the penalties, right? Like there's, there's so much stuff that they can build on and take from this game and make improvements on that. You, it doesn't mean that it won't happen again or that there's no possibility of it happening again. No, of course, like these things happen, but if you can, go on the road and win by 17 points in, in that, those types of conditions that bodes well, it's a, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, Nate, just a, oops, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Fitz. No, 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 no you go ahead. I got a message this morning. Apparently the athletic podcast was talking about how every top 10 team this week was probably worried after Saturday, except Penn state who went on the road and just handled their business. So that's the perception uh, versus the internal, like the, the, the watching and breaking down every play versus the macro, which watches Michigan struggle in the first half against was a Bowling green this weekend. Um, you know, you've got this all over the uh, ooh, Tom Seaver reference. I like that. Um, it's just all over um, college football right now is, is guys are getting, you know, those gears flowing and, and you're going to see your best football played later in the year um, health willing. And uh, yeah, I think it's kind of everywhere right now. So I think if, if I learned anything at Penn state C plus passes the test, like and Penn state <laughs> had a C plus this weekend and they passed the test by 17 points. Um, and that's, that's what it's all about. So what? just a quick, just uh, Nate, uh, just a quick preview of like what's coming up on the film room and talking about the Penn State run defense. It's about learning from your mistakes and getting better. And what Illinois was trying to do, Penn State thwarted their like, here's the wrinkle for Penn State. And the linebackers and everyone played that particular situation better than they have in the past. That's progress. That, that's, that's getting better as a run defense. So I just I wanted to throw that out there in terms of like what we see in the standard, et cetera. Nate, you were going to make a point. I, this, very briefly, one of the things that I took great delight in on Saturday was James Franklin coming into the postgame media area ready for a fight, right, with the media yeah. in that he was going to be effusively optimistic. He was not, right? So he came in with the attitude and the mindset of, like, you know that 10 minutes prior to that, he was chewing them out. Right. He was like he was giving it a total earful to his team saying, look, these are all the things that we got to get cleaned up. Blah, right. Et cetera, et cetera. But the message that, that I took from that post game was, all right, I'm going to lay into them, but you're not right. You, you guys are not going to be the ones to critique this because this is still exactly the result that you are trying to get. Right. So is it perfect? No. But also uh, this is this is not a condition, not a situation for overly dramatic critique. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they going back to the score, not to be scoreboard, but 30 to 13 is a comfortable win in the Big Ten. And complimentary football, Penn State played that on Saturday, the defense coming up big and getting um the opportunities for the offense to work through their issues. And that's where I'm going to leave it for what I've got. We can preview Iowa. I know it's Monday. I have seen zero of this Iowa team specifically. Fitz, you've given us, I think, the no, best you, preview. You've seen it all. Don't don't worry. You've seen it all. <laughs> but it's maybe you haven't watched this year's tape. You've, you've seen it. Yes. Trust yeah. Me. Uh, so just in general, a recap again for us. I always want to make sure we have a little bit of a nugget of a preview of that's what everyone wants. 
about the show. So so what what are you looking for in this game in terms of the classical Iowa team and how they match up with what Penn State does and what we've seen them do so far? Yeah, we're going to see how those transfer uh, additions this offseason from Iowa. I mean, they they're they're there. I don't want to say backs on the rope, but that that Brian Ferenz thing is is present every week it's about scoring enough points. And that's not really a Ferenz thing. It's it's a college football thing. I mean, that team has underachieved in the sense that like if they had a competent offense at times, they would be a really, really good football team. So much of the fact that they might be Penn State's most natural rival in the Big Ten. But, OK, maybe not. Some might say. Yeah. Some some might say that some people are saying that, um, but no, I think it's a, a lot of uh, it's tough to preview Iowa every year because you have the you know it's kind of cut cut copy paste and uh, mm-hmm. that's that's we're gonna get. But it's gonna be interesting to see how those um, transfers add another wrinkle. Um, uh, Luke Lachey uh, is on crutches. I think that's a big deal. He's a really good tight end. Um, they still have Eric All, but that's a really good tight end. And we know Iowa just from ever, ever since you were watching Iowa since you were a little kid has relied on tight ends. Um, so that's, uh, that's something, certainly something to not sniff at. I mean, he's a really good player. So be interested to see how, uh, how things are different, how things change a well-coached defense going to try and confuse the hell out of a first time starting at quarterback or starter at quarterback. And that's the, that's gonna be the theme of the game. Nate, any final thoughts here on the show? Anything you want to, uh, preview maybe coming up of blue white illustrated.com. Yeah, we're I no, I'm ready for for yeah, the big game special for sure, 50% off and we'll and we'll lean in on this, right? I mean, this is going to be yeah. a big week for for Blue White Illustrated as we get I think some reactions. You know that that Franklin's not going to take the bait, right? He he's not going to get too deep into the weeds if at all on some of the I think rightful offense that was taken to some of the comments about Penn State after after that game, right where they lost PJ Mustafer for uh, the season, right, <laughs> right, like just the, really the injury stuff. Bit, man, really committed to the bit. <laughs> I am, or he? No, oh, PJ, PJ was. PJ. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ru- sure. Ruined yeah. his NFL well, draft stock for two years. Stick really it to those committed Iowa to fans. It. Um, no, so look, it, it'll be. It, it, this is from my perspective as right the media and a reporter. It, I'm I'm interested to see how Penn state handles it because it first of all, there were a lot of players on this Penn state team that were not out there, right. That didn't play or were not involved in that game. Obviously the coaching staff was, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see kind of how they, uh, how they navigate that because you know that the questions are coming. So yeah, big week. And then Fitz recruiting, right? You know, I I just pulled up the show. Yeah. Ryan's been adding to it since, um, we started here and it has doubled since we started here. Um, so it's, it's a big weekend. Notre Dame, Ohio state's going to cut into it probably pretty significantly for some top guys. Um, but at the same time, it's a whiteout. It's something kids want to come from all over the country to see. So I'm, I'm excited to see this final visitor list, uh, when we get going and it's also a rankings day at, uh, on three. So check out our stuff uh, a little bit later. We've got some, I've seen the rankings gone behind the, behind the curtain there. Uh, Penn state's I think going to have a good day in that. We'll get to all of that at bluewhiteillustrated.com. Once again, as you saw earlier, sign up for 50% off the season, your, your year-long subscription. There are other ways you can sign up. You can sign up for a dollar, but why would you want to save a dollar when you can save $50? I, I think that makes sense to me. Uh, that'll do it for the BWI Live Show. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. Thanks to these guys for an awesome job. Once again, Sean Fitz, Nate Bauer coming, giving you the perspective of Penn State, Illinois. We are now moving on to the uh, whiteout game. That's coming up this week on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel. We'll talk to you then.